Okay, this evening we're actually going to speak to Dr. Aaron Corey and Hugo Boothby from Malmo University. And we had a great discussion um, in our reading group for sounds like home, the synchrony and dissonance of podcasting as a boundary object. So without any delay, I'm going to hand you over now to Corey or Aaron, sorry, and Hugo to discuss um, their paper with us. Great, Hugo, do you want to introduce yourself? First? Yeah. So uh, my name is Hugo. I am British, and um, but based in Malmo. So I've lived in Malmo now for uh, twelve years, and before that, I lived in the UK and I worked for BBC World Service Radio for about ten years. And then during that time, I also worked on secondment uh, as the London bureau producer for NPR, the uh, US um, public service broadcaster. So. Yeah, that's my background and I've been teaching radio production in Malmö and now I'm doing a, a PhD. So, Erin, do you, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, my name is Erin Corey and um, I am a senior lecturer in uh, Media and Communication Studies at Malmö University and I co-direct the master's program. Um, in Media and Communication Studies. I'm originally from California and did my PhD at the University of California, San Diego and finished in 2015 and then had a postdoc in Refugee Migration and Media Studies at Malmo University um, and then was brought in as a, as a senior lecturer, which I feel really lucky about. Um, after I got some funding from Riksbank and Zubileums Fund um, for a three-year research project. Um, and right, so I've kind of taught and researched between the U.S. border region, um, Scandinavia, and um, the Swana region, especially um, Lebanon, where I did my PhD field work. So that's us, and we're both part of a research lab called yeah. Medea. We should mention that too, yeah. if people want to check that out. I, I think that's actually quite yeah. interesting because the Medea research platform that we're both part of kind of combines media studies and interaction design, which is the two kind of research areas in our department. And it's kind of a little bit, this kind of work and particularly engaging with boundary objects comes a little bit out of that crossover because boundary objects is one of those concepts within interaction design and um, collaborative design research. That's good. Yeah. And we have we had a podcast series in the before times called Medea Vox that we're hoping to revive shortly with our colleagues. So that's all online. And I guess then we can get started. Um, so we are going to talk um, about <clears throat> our article, um, which was published in Radio Studies. Um, called Sounds Like Home, The Synchrony and Dissonance of Podcasting as Boundary Object. And I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of uh, background on the origins of um, the article and the Picturing Home Project uh, more largely. So um, the RJ, or the Riksbank and Zibeleums Fund funded project that um, uh, this project, the Picturing Home kind of segment of things came out of, um, has its roots in my postdoc, where I was thinking about how young asylum seekers and refugees who were living in Sweden and Denmark in the sort of Orison region more broadly, um, were negotiating changing identities by performing self and community in online and offline spaces. And one of the threads that I kept having in the conversations um, with folks was that they felt like they were bearing a really undue burden, not just to integrate, but to assimilate, um, which seemed a bit much in societies that were professing kind of, you know, forward thinking, acceptance, multiculturalism, etc. Um, so from their perspective, um, they felt it was really important that autochthonous Scandinavians should also integrate into the new order things, new order of things, excuse me. So that was one thing. Um, what is integration really? And what is it from an official perspective? What does it look like? What does it signify on the ground? And at the same time, I was grappling with some questions that I've been grappling with for a while. So who am I doing this work for really? Um, and I felt like that was a really uncomfortable question for sure, but I think that that discomfort can be a tool that registers things like privilege, power, and an ethical charge. Um, so the more I mold this over, um, I realized that the question I ought to be asking was more, who am I doing this with? Um, so I'm not going to read through this whole thing, <laughs> but um, I am a Maggie O'Neill fangirl. Um, 
But I wrote a, a blog post in 2017 for the European Network on Cultural Management and Policy, which just ended up turning me on to Maggie O'Neill's work. And I was looking for a kind of a different way to think about cultural policy initiatives. So her work came into my line of vision. Um, she's a professor of sociology and criminology at the University uh, College Cork and head of um, the Department of Sociology and Criminology and a member of the Center for the Study of the Moral Foundations of Economy and Society. But this method, ethnomimesis, that she espouses just really kind of just did it for me. It really kind of hit the nail on the head of what I thought might be a useful um, method for engaging some of the folks I was working with um, in this postdoc project. Um, she's a couple pieces about this, also one she did with um, Phil Hubbard. But the basic idea is that it's a hyphen between ethnographic, biographical work, and art, um, where researchers are working um, in collaboration with artists, performance artists, writers, poets, photographers, and participants. And importantly, mimesis here isn't intended to mimic or reflect reality, but to encourage a moment of cognition through which we can develop a critical perspective that includes empathy through sensuous knowing. Um, so it's a, an idea that, you know, is supposed to incorporate or a method that is supposed to incorporate feeling involvement as well as cognitive reflection. And it felt to me like this suited the post-migration context very well, which is really what my interlocutors and during the postdoc were talking about and where they were situating themselves in the sense that the post-migration context, um, you know, this is a, a term that has been circulating through, through academia for the last like decade or so, but is really kind of taking up up a renewed charge right now, um, which is a reaction against the negative or derogatory use of the term migrant as an external description of, of identity. Um, so <clears throat> folks that I was talking to really understood themselves to be very much fundamental parts of the society that they had adopted. Um, and this kind of method seemed to be one way of getting at these kinds of collaborations that were sort, sort of starting to form on the ground. Um, and so this, you know, this idea of people doing things to, together um, through ethnomimetic methods um, really made, I think, really made sense for the work that I was doing at the time. So it was with this in mind that I wrote the application for the grant um, and I proposed a critical multi-sided ethnography that would connect participatory art practice with shifting understandings of integration in contemporary urban Sweden. Um, so I was looking at how spaces dedicated to artistic collaboration contribute to changing popular notions and experiences of integration, what new publics are generated by these practices and spaces. Um, and I was, you know, proposing a project that would work with um, people with migration backgrounds as well as um, locals or autochthonous Swedes. Um, originally, this was going to happen at two places. The moment I got the funding, one of them shut down, <laughs> as like often happens. Um, but I, I kept um, working with Konst Kupan, um, which is the art hive in Malmo, and they were a grassroots um, organization that was a creative space for young new arrivals to engage in all kinds of different creative practice with um, local practitioners and just, you know, locals who were interested in the space. And it was in a really kind of a beautiful area area or a beautiful building that had housed a lot of um, local artists you know they had their studios there um, and it was uh, like fairly accessible um, and it's been shut down because of um, funding which is a whole other conversation about sustainability for these kinds of projects um, but during that time that I was working with them they went through a lot of changes and leadership etc and we were just about ready to go with a series of workshops and Hugo was coming on board for part of his PhD. We had this idea of doing a project called Many Malmos where we were going to do sort of group sensory walks, remake maps of Malmo, do storytelling tours, the photographic and written documentation, and then the pandemic hit and that was two years ago. And I remember um, panicking. And then Hugo came in as the voice of reason and was like, what if we took this online? And also what if we did a podcast about it? Um, which was an incredible kind of correction of course. And I will never um, stop being grateful that he was part of it because it really opened up whole new vistas um, for this project and for some of the questions that we were able to ask. 
Um, so we made this all digital and this project picturing home took place over five weeks. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the workshops. We had one three hour Zoom workshop per week with participants around themes like teaching home and sounds like home. Um, people, the people who participated were a mix of longtime Malmo residents, people from Europe and North America, new arrivals to Sweden, both refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and throughout the course of the workshops, we found that in many ways, we all shared some sort of background that had to do with migration, including economic and class and labor migrations. Um, so the Zoom video conferences that we um, that were used to connect workshop participants um, sort of established this intimacy by bringing them into each other's homes. And they were structured around tasks that we jokingly called our homework that encouraged participants to reflect on experiences of migration, home and belonging. Um, which kind of allowed for some impro improvisation and spontaneity um, with the participants from Konstkupan, Malmo University, and other places getting to know each other in this sort of very convivial environment. And we recorded these sessions with understanding that we would never show them, that they were going to be, um, they were going to be, uh, you know, kept close and protected. Um, but we and and folks curated a sort of an Instagram archive in the in betweens between our meetings um, with sounds and images about the themes we were talking about. <clears throat> excuse me, every week. So a lot of this had to do with memories of their home countries, um, arrivals to Sweden, um, tastes and sounds that they long for, things they brought with them. Um, so it's very, again, you know, kind of this sensuous or sensory understanding that is a part and parcel of ethnomimesis. Um, you can still visit on Instagram, it's still up there. And then with the podcast process, um, every week a couple of people were invited um, onto the podcast to talk about the previous week's session. Hugo did a wonderful job of pulling out some great segments of the audio. And then we worked through a script and sent it to like a general script with general questions that we wanted to hit on and sent it to the people who were going to be part of it so that they had time to think about their answers and also to think about whether or not any the questions were appropriate, something they wanted to talk about. Um, so just to give you a taste of what this sounded like, I'm gonna play this and hopefully you can hear it. <laughs> This is Picturing Home, a podcast production by Konskup on Malmo and Malmo University. We're also sharing our work on Instagram. You can visit us at picturing.home. Okay, so departing from this sense of safety, um, another theme that emerged was the liabilities of home. And another person who participated in this talking picture session was Atusa, who is the artistic director of Konskupan, and she co-hosted the last podcast with Hugo. Um, so she talked quite poignantly about this toward the end of our session. Let's listen. I don't want to sometimes be reminded that I'm from Iran. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know that I'm from somewhere else, that I haven't been there more than nine years and most of the questions you get every day is where are you from where that you haven't been there more than nine years and somehow you i don't want to think about memories or things that i have had there because then it's have another effect on your mind that you're thinking about things of a place that you are not allowed to go or be yeah. um and uh, you have paid a lot of consequences because you're born there, because you're from that country. Okay, so that was just a, a very short clip of Atusa, who is um, just kind of a wonderful um, mover and shaker, a wonderful human being, very creative, <laughs> amazing. Um, but this sort of transmedia storytelling that uh, took shape um, really, I think, complemented the transnational belonging that ethnomimesis aims for in the sense that this back and forth allowed space for different modes and registers of self-representation and self-reflection between these different media, between the workshops, the Instagram archive, and the podcasting. So reflection on how people's identities changed and on their connections to others. Oops, sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, so in this article, we draw on Star and Greisemer's idea of the boundary object to theorize our podcasting practice. 
So boundary objects are technologies and work processes that bridge social worlds and service sites of communication and translation across the different communities of practice that work with them. And we found this particularly useful in theorizing how our participants experienced the making of the podcast in a sense that the podcast itself was a boundary object and that it held space for multiple folks from varied backgrounds and with very different experiences of migration and different memories and ideas they wish to share, and yet remain something that was understandable to everyone, to all participants, and served as another point of contact through which they could talk and share their thoughts and memories with each other and an imagined listening public in a very intimate audio format. Um, and it's important, I think, also to say that Const Coupon was in many ways already positioned as a boundary object, um, a common space where people with and without migration backgrounds could express themselves through the tools and supplies at hand, um, working together with practitioners and teachers from a diversity of artistic disciplines. So Picturing Home was trying to contribute to this key part of Const Coupon's mission by providing a bridge between um, Const Coupon's regular participants and the university. Um, and I, I also, I, I don't think I mentioned, but um, the podcasting recording took place on Zencaster, which was a really useful software tool that um, Hugo brought in, where we could just record from our living rooms, which was also um, very nice. Um, and it's important also to note that participants were already really um, familiar with social media. They were all pretty avid users with their own personal Facebook and Instagram accounts, and also started engaging with each other's posts on the Instagram feed for the project and each other's personal um, Instagram accounts as well. So this um, tacking back and forth between these different accounts um, and between personal use and the meaning attributed to the communal account and its overall mission or goals was a really also dynamic part of, of this process um, of building up this boundary object um, for the picturing home participants. And Hugo? Yeah. So I think I mean, Erin's described the context um, really well. And I think one of the things that was definitely kind of transformative about this was this opportunity to connect Const Coupon and the university. So one of their missions was to engage with public spheres that often people with a migration background are excluded from. And so the project provided that a, a really good way to connect Const Coupon with a group of researchers from the university. And what was fascinating about uh, this kind of uh, concept of the, the boundary object was that, I mean, it's from like the late 80s. Um, it comes from research uh, on a, a, a museum, but it kind of mapped very, very well onto podcasting. So uh, Star and Greismer, it comes from... Um, actor network theory and science and technology studies and and particularly this kind of interest in the affordances of different technologies and what they limit or, or make possible for for the users and they they define this kind of uh, these characteristics of the boundary object i think there's five in in total um and a, a main one is ideal type so this means that a, a boundary object has to be recognizable by everyone that that's in, involved you have to know what it is and feel comfortable with it and podcasting kind of seemed to fulfill this really well because it was so much a part of everyone's lives in different ways. But what's really important here is that not everyone has to agree exactly what it is or how you would use it or what value it might bring to you. It doesn't have to, to uh, maintain consensus. It can be different things to different people. So that maps really well onto the podcasting history that Kind of emerged from this DIY uh, amateur um, activist tradition and then has become kind of formalized and consolidated as a commercial mass medium. Um, it kind of meant that there were lots of different ways that people had used podcasting, you know, as consumers and producers and, and was, a, you know, it was open to lots of different interpretations. And then the other kind of category, which, which again maps very, very well onto podcasting, is this idea of a repository. So this comes from work that was uh, about a museum and how a museum generated knowledge with a kind of broad selection of stakeholders. And they talk about a repository as a kind of indexed um, pile of information. And we kind of realized that 
our podcast hosted on SoundCloud, aggregated on um, iTunes, made available to anyone that wanted it to, you know, uh, use it as they would like, was, was a kind of very clear example of a repository of, of, of information and, and, and knowledge that was being produced in this uh, collaborative um, media production. So do, can you go on to the next slide, Erin? So, um, yeah, so the, this, as Erin described, the, the kind of the, the work that we did, Erin uh, planned these five workshops which addressed different themes. Um, there, were, there were quite loose conversations around these kind of prompts and people sharing their stories and experiences. And then from that, we went back and took out kind of clips as you would like building a, a magazine type show uh, clips of people talking, uh, you know, uh, things that we thought might stimulate a nice discussion or, or reflection. And again, this kind of research was really informed by action research and this kind of iterative process where you kind of learn from other people, you you do something, you learn from that, you do something again and, and keep on developing it. So kind of taking material from the workshop, uh, listening to it as part of a podcast, Erin was leading a really nice um, discussion and an interview process ar around this of gradually deepening reflection on the on the whole process and, and you know generating some really nice um, programs. Um, yeah, can we go on to the next slide? So yeah, the idea is that as a, a boundary object, these this material that we generated, it could be different things uh, to different people. And one of the, the things that we thought was interesting was that there seemed to be this narrative that podcasting was becoming less radical, that it's kind of moment of uh, transformation, this kind of exciting uh, DIY activist medium had been, you know, had, had passed and it had been completely um, taken into the, into the mainstream. And, and we felt that actually the work that we were doing sort of recognised some kind of potential in podcasting as a research tool, as a, a tool for pedagogy, um, as a tool for activism, and, and that it, you know, it was too early to kind of write podcasting off as a, a kind of activist medium. And one of the things that we thought was interesting was this kind of idea around affordance and that podcasting and radio affords these kind of intimate narratives. And I think this idea of using Zoom to collect audio material and then a podcast that was concentrating on audio narratives helped to kind of increase this um, intimate engagement and sharing of, of intimate narr narrative. So this is something that comes out of uh, Mia Lindgren's uh, work. Um, yeah, so it's very much about the kind of affordances of an audio medium um, and, and that kind of engagement that it gives both when you're producing media, but also for a, a listener or a potential listening audience so yeah one of the things you know we, we consider this to be kind of practice based or um, artistic research project so it's a you know we're, we're creating knowledge in the production itself but then also as a boundary object the podcast becomes uh, an object which can articulate that knowledge in to a, a, a different audience can, can you move on to the next slide yeah, so one of the ways we conceptualized this kind of potential for con uh, sharing this knowledge that we generated with a, an audience that was removed from the initial creation uh, was this idea from Kate Lacey around the listening public. So this idea that uh, audio material has a potential to, to generate a listening experience which is uh, qualitatively different to a, a visual um, reading public. Um, yeah, so this, this idea of trying to reclaim listening as, a, as an active political activity. So often listening is presented as being passive. Um, it's not as significant as uh, speech or writing in terms of political expression. But the understanding we had and, and taking it from, from Lacey is this idea that politics exists in reciprocity and in the regard of others and part of that is the auditing of a 
listening public. Do you, do you want to move on to the next? That's right. So this is a, a, a quote that I think is, is particularly re revealing from one of our participants. I'm just going to read it. So she's talking about the experience of moving from a kind of visual uh, environment in Zoom to kind of concentrating just on listening and talking and, and engaging uh, through sound. So she says the difference between doing the workshop and seeing each other and then the podcast and only focusing on hearing makes it stand out in a different way because you don't have that distraction. You focus on what the person is actually saying. You listen more and how that feels too, uh, to you then based on the tone of their voice and the words they're saying. So what I think is particularly interesting about this is this idea of like a concentrated listening, but also the tone of someone's voice. So the, the kind of information that we get in the, this kind of non-semantic register, like the tone of someone's voice, the, the, the quality of hearing a human voice and, and how that feels. And this idea of feeling as being important in terms of um, affect theory. And that one of the things that I think is a risk in radio studies is that there's often a focus on the logocentric on the text, either spoken or written, and you know things which are more easily, uh, which have a, a, a stronger tradition of analysis within the academy. So I think what, what I'm calling for is a, is a shift towards sound studies and, and that kind of engagement with affect and non-semantic sound. So I think the next one, and then I, th I think it's you, Erin. It is me, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was great, Hugo. And like now, I have other things that I, yeah, we can talk about during discussion. But that's fantastic. Um, so these episodes um, really became an archive of not only this fledgling community's individual memories and ideas, but also its kind of idea of itself or memory of itself in its first state of emergence. Um, it's a record of a time and a place in a way and, and a togetherness that really might not have happened if it weren't for the pandemic. I can't believe I'm saying that. Some weird like silver lining and this strange intimacy and synchrony that we were afforded through our online work together. So, I mean, a lot of our participants said, you know, if we had had this at Comst Coupon, I'm not sure I would have made it after work or I'm not sure I would have made it there at all. Um, but we were able to, from the start, like go into each other's homes meet comfortably from our couches, dial in easily for recording section, et cetera. And it's important, I think, also to note that um, when we talk about the resonance that people felt with each other, that it doesn't have to happen in the moment, um, as this quote um, from Schindler's work on, um, on the boundary object and arts um, reminds us, um, and that the effective potential of the stories and memories people told is really what helped people to connect and to sync up together. So we had like a, there was one particular moment where um, one of our participants was talking about a certain kind of light that she remembered from her childhood um, from afternoons and she had a beautiful photo of this home space from when she was a child and remembered laying on the floor in this pool of, of kind of golden hour light. And another participant, it comes from a very different part of the world, was like, I know exactly what you mean. and I'm always looking for that light, you know, wherever I go. Um, so those kinds of moments, you know, where people from very different kinds of places, spaces, and, um, you know, ages as well, were able to connect over those memories and um, that sensory, um, those sensory memories was really um, uh, very powerful. Um, it's also a record of some of the dissonances that happened as well, um, the subjectivities and positionalities that were shaping our experience of Sweden in 2020, um, which I think probably the most, um, the clearest example of that was when Jasmine, who um, originally hails from Iraq and has memories of a country where dissent was frequently violently silenced, and Malin, who is a local Malmo resident, um, disagreed on whether or not to attend a Black Lives Matter protest in Malmo. Um, and this was a really interesting, like a very like 
um, heartfelt and um, earnest and open conversation. Um, because for Jasmine, I mean, this was a no-brainer. So her chance, a chance to publicly and safely show up to support an important movement for her was something that had to happen. It was very important for her. Well, for Malin, there were other considerations uh, to think about like the performative politics of the movement and cultural appropriation. So that was a really interesting conversation too about our specific kind of cultural and political setting in Malmö. Um, and then finally, I mean, Hugo mentioned also thinking about podcasting as a research object and the idea with, you know, kind of reframing it in this way, um, you know, in part was to re-harness re that idea of the radical potential of podcasting, which we do not think has been lost. Um, and in part, it's because it feels like it is a really interesting way to dismantle the bordering practices of academia, um, to reach out beyond the walls of the university, to expert and non-expert groups, to disrupt the kind of paywalls that often, you know, foreclose people's access to information, um, and to different communities of practice um, and cultural communities. Um, but it's also, you know, I think one of the things that is, of course, really important is that there were definitely um, many um, power imbalances that remained, right? So um, like Hugo said, in terms of the boundary object, I mean, what participants took away from their participation and the connections they made both to each other and to their own experiences um, were very clearly different depending on their own positionality within the context of Malmo in spring of 2020 in Scandinavia, you know, and um, so there were a lot of other things to consider. And then there are things that are just the practical parts of things, like the fact that we used English as our lingua franca. You know, we advertised in Farsi, Arabic, Swedish, and English. But, I mean, there were people who were there who could translate, um, uh, who were participating, who could translate for people who maybe had a question about language. Um, but the podcast is in English. Um, Hugo and I have this on our CVs now, which is also, you know, problematic in a lot of ways. Um, like, I know we still maintain connections with the folks who participated, which is great. And they also connect with each other, which is also good. But, you know, it's a short-term podcast. So there's also, there are also questions about that and sustainability again. Um, and then Hugo. This is your last bit. So this was just kind of the, a reflection and kind of where this this work led me, which is kind of to focusing more on sound and the experience of, of sound. And so I just wanted to kind of finish on this. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with uh, Salome Vogelin. She's a professor at um, London College of Communication, uh, mm -hmm. University of the Arts London. Um, and so just this uh, quote, she talks about a sonic sensibility, that embracing this sonic sensibility where we engage, where, where she would understand that we engage, our engagement with the world through sound is qualitatively different to an engagement which privile privileges the visual. And I think part of this is about this idea of, of contesting the boundaries within academia. So part of the pro podcast project was it was really important to us both that this was made available outside any paywalls to and presented in a way that was kind of hopefully entertaining and accessible that it kind of um invited both experts and non-experts in you know into some kind of listening experience that was the intention um and in the same way i think work that privileges sound is also challenging this these this boundarying in um academia which privileges the visual and and particularly written text so part of what we are trying to do is kind of articulate these things through a kind of sonic um epistemology as um Vogelin would say so so listening as a sensibility as a susceptibility towards uh the world and the things is not only a physiological act but an aesthetic and perceptual attitude that influences how we understand the world it's reality, knowledge, and truth. And there's our final slide. Yeah. <laughs> you have our emails. So. Well, not at all. Listen, thank you um, to both of you, Aaron and Hugo. Sure.
So I suppose we can now open um, question <laughs> time to the floor. <laughs> and get ready that was really interesting there's so many things buzzing mm. around in my head and yeah. actually you mentioned um pedagogy there um i don't know if you know of jerome um he has written a very interesting piece on public pedagogy as well mm. so you might like to look that up it kind of fits in around um embodies what you're talking about but yeah we'll open that to questions from um joe or alex if you're there um i i think it I'll, I'll read through the questions that we were left with after our our discussion. Uh, that's our great. Discussion last term, if that's OK. But, thank but you. firstly, thank you so much for a brilliant presentation that that drew um, on the core of, of the article. And, and it was really interesting. Thank you. And um, one of the questions that we did have was um, how many participants did you have who had signed up to the original um art practice project pre-covid and how many of those then signed up so so did you have lots and lots that were going to do the in-person stuff and then a small percentage we were quite interested to know if there was any drop off that's a really good question um no there wasn't really i mean the thing with const coupon was it was very um like fluid, you know, there were there were certain things like um, sort of established dance workshops um, that people went to kind of weekly if they could. And um, but with this one, like we had literally, I think, just started advertising for it, right, Hugo? Like it was, if I remember yeah. right, it feels like a decade ago at this point. Um, the last it's like time doesn't exist after the pandemic and it's bizarre but I feel like I feel like we had just been advertising it and trying to make it circulate mm -hmm. and we there had been some interest um but we were really kind of like gunning for it so I, I don't actually know there wasn't really a sign up sheet per se um there was some interest but I from my perspective I mean having been hanging out, at Const Coupon at that point for a couple of years um, and seeing kind of, you know, like it was kind of unpredictable how many people would come to different events because of jobs, family obligations, what have you, or just exhaustion. I think a lot of people, I mean, they were just dealing with a lot. Um, I think we probably ended up maybe having just as many people as would have gone to the actual workshop, if not, more more regularly it wasn't a big group mm. what, what about you Hugo yeah I, I think I mean I remember that we, we just had the dates confirmed yeah like almost like the week or yeah. before the restrictions came in and, and made it impossible but I, I remember we had a kind of informal midway evaluation with yeah. Atusa yeah. and she was saying you know she was really happy with how things were going um but like her communication with some of the the younger or those people who were kind of in more precarious situations in their kind of uh, network, they either didn't have the technology or they didn't feel comfortable accessing the workshops in that way. And I think what we missed out on was the kind of like drop in and impromptu word of mouth kind of thing so we, we we lost out there i think we might you know have got people who would you know happen to be there because they just came for a coffee and then got excited yeah. about it yeah. um but what we gained was a really kind of solid connection with particularly the kind of the core members of that group i think we got a kind of perhaps a deeper engagement from the the core but we, we got less engagement from the kind of periphery yeah so what, what was it about a dozen people what was the sort of oh, cohort <laughs> how many were we like seven or eight usually yeah, i think it was about it was about that number mm -hmm. um and and then the kind of because then we we selected or asked invited different people each week mm -hmm. to, to to be part of the podcast so i think most people were involved in the podcast in the end. I mean, one of my favorite um, 
episodes was with Latusa and Cash yeah. when they were kind of together in in Latusa's apartment and Cash kind of who's a musician kind of they talking a lot about the the you know experience of living in Iran and Cash did this kind of impromptu rap and that was really good. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. And can I ask also if there was any, you know, ethics that you had to jump through loops and hoops, um, you know, because you were doing a study and a podcast? Mm. Yeah, that was that was tricky because I had to apply for ethical approval in Sweden, which Hugo knows recently is um, a lot. Um, and um, so I eventually had it approved like well in advance of the podcast, but we weren't planning on doing the podcast. <laughs> so we, I mean, we just asked people if they were happy to record and got their confirmation sort of audib or orally, audibly. Um, but in terms of like the ethics of the podcast, I mean, I think this was one thing, and this is kind of um, touching on some some writing that I'm doing about podcasting right now too. And I'm loving like hearing what Hugo is working on. I think that was it's really fantastic. Um, but one of the things that I think was was really nice about the podcast format and the fact that there was like a rough cut that Hugo then edited brilliantly was that people could hear like what they said and and like ask to have it edited if that was important to them. Or even kind of during the recording of the rough cut, um, we had some conversations where we realized as soon as something was said, that should, probably should be struck from the record and we probably shouldn't broadcast that because of concerns about um, the migration authority um, and people's safety and access to Sweden. Um, so that was, that I think was, um, for me at least as a researcher really um, important and um, I think the people I like to think I think the people that we were working with felt like there was um, a fair amount of care work involved there that we were being very cautious with their stories um, and this is sort of you know I think where um, Hugo am I saying this the right way like you're talking about like sonic epistemology yeah, so I just wrote a piece on um, on the power of like the ethics of voice and also the importance of silence in podcast practice and like what stories don't get told. So kind of drawing on Eve Tuck's work and Kay Wayne Yang's work about objecting research, like work that that does not objectify and instead objects to academia's timelines and the sort of desire to curate and display stories that are often about trauma um, and instead to to kind of find a different way of doing things. Um, so I think that like hearing people's stories and having those conversations around you know what what gets um, played, what gets archived, like sonically archived yeah. was really important too. yeah. That's great, thank you. Yeah. But it, I mean it's interesting that you mentioned the ethic Cool concerns was I've had some issues on another project yeah. um, oh and there's definitely a shift in in Sweden that yeah. the like data protection has become very dominant mm -hmm. as a concern and uh, informed consent is no longer considered to be a, a you know a, a, um, a re, you know a, a defense against mm -hmm you know, using someone's uh, recorded voice. So it, it's, and, and, you know, I think one of the big problems is that it's only an issue with data storage if it's someone, if it's considered to be sensitive personal data. So it's this idea again of categorizing. So even people that would prefer not to be categorized as migrants, they're considered to be vulnerable. Therefore their data is sensitive personal data. Even if they say we're happy to have this, used and broadcast the the Swedish ethics authority can still refuse you permission to do the work which is kind of yeah it's very interesting yeah it's really problematic yeah um may, may I just probably further that discussion a little bit because it, it also ties in with with who you had involved you you do mention that 
I think in the article, I think you mentioned the term digital divide as well, mm. um, in terms of, so not just potential participants not feeling comfortable, but maybe they didn't even have access to the technology or couldn't afford the mobile data or the internet. Did, so um, if you were to do this sort of thing again, how might you oh. overcome those barriers? <laughs> Oh my goodness. I have thoughts. Hugo, do you want to? Yeah. I mean, the thing that was one of the, we, we said that we, we, um, we're part of this research platform, uh, Medea, and, and Medea has a, a podcast or do have a podcast, but the producers now all moved on to, to do another job. And we're thinking about how we might work with that. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the things that I'd be really interested in, in doing is kind of trying to capture some of the original idea around walking and, and mapping the city. And I think that I would be really interested in exploring kind of audio content, which is based around walking and about like capturing people's narratives as, as they move through the city. And, and I mean, it's kind of a very conventional radio format where you, you know, talk to someone as you walk around their home city and they explain things to you and it's kind of you know a very visual radio format and i you know that's something i'd like to explore because i think there's a lot of podcasting which is very i mean it's it's great because it's, it's very democratic and anyone can do it and sit in their kitchen and do it but i think there's lots of really studio bound quite kind of dry sounding podcast and to get out and go and meet people go with them to the places that they inhabit and you know it could be done really like a, a lo-fi with just a you know voice message app you know if that was yeah. what was required you know but i think there's lots of currency in, in doing that kind of work i think that's so great i think we're, we're in conversations about how to revive the podcast right now and i think that's exactly the direction that i would hope we would go for sure. And I mean, that's also kind of when we think about our university's kind of mission and how they want to reach out beyond the university and they want to be a partner and, you know, the city's culture. And I think that that's exactly the kind of project that should be happening. But then I also think that, like, I mean, I think that there are opportunities now that we're able to meet, you know, that if we did something like this again, you would hope that maybe there would be something where we could share in some of the like technical expertise in a studio at the university, um, because that has also been a question of like, like what I've heard from so many people, including at Tusa, is that and like Ansad, who is the director of Kunskupan, is like the university. I mean, you'd have to kind of know the city, but the university is literally like a tower at the edge of the city. Um, by the harbor and they're like it's so not accessible like we don't feel comfortable just like walking in you know um, so that would be kind of a, a wonderful way of using the university's resources to give people some kind of technical training um, be amazing kind of under the auspices of a project like this but something that people could use in other ways in other parts of their lives could be pretty great yeah it would be great and Sorry, you got, I was just going to ask if you have um, a student radio in the oh. building. No. 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 <laughs> um, no. There's been various attempts to kind of generate something, but it, it's never, it's never worked. There's a very kind of well-established student radio in Lund, which is the kind of so Lund is like one of the oldest universities in Sweden, which and it's very close to Malmö, and there's a very well established um, student radio there. So kind of that sucks up all the energy, I think. Mm. There's been some cool, you know. Yeah. It's, it's funny because well, I suppose the, that that would really. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Erin. Sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I think there was a little bit of. No, a... I was saying that it would have helped with editing. Then you know that that would have helped. You know, with teaching editing because I know we have a, we have a student radio, um, in Mary Immaculate College, and they do teach editing to people. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go and volunteer. So, but it would they also do podcasting in the evening with actual migrants, and there are programs running there, Erasmus programs, for you know we have a very large traveling community here in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And we also have people in horrendous um, direct provision 
but also immigrants that have come here, you know, that, that they're teaching people how to edit and make radio programs, mm -hmm. just like podcasting to get the voice out there. So it's, it's, but they've also something that you might consider, which sounds a little bit off piste here, um, to make the college more accessible and more, um, and bring people into the college. They did take down the rather large walls that were around Mary Immaculate College a number of years ago. And they did some uplighting that really, when you're walking past, you're intrigued by looking at it. But they also created um, a community choir, which is really amazing. So they mixed, we'd say people from the community coming in and singing with people on the work time. Um, so if you have a music department or anybody that's interested in choirs, it really brought so the community and the college together. So that's just a by the by for um, inclusion if you wanted to go down that route. But I'm Wonderful. sure Josephine now has more questions for you. Yeah, that was actually part of the, like one of the things that I had thought about for the kind of walking tours around Malmo was that we would do some kind of like musical performance in a public space yeah. um, to kind of like presence, you know, people like in spaces where maybe they hadn't felt comfortable before without kind of a community of people around them, you know, so sort of that yeah. kind of intervention. Um, but I love the idea of singing together and making noise. Yeah. I mean, there, there was a lunchtime choir at the university, but it again like the university is so far on the edge of the city it's like not even in it's not even do you know am, am i describing that correctly hugo like it's sort of like like there's not a lot around it that is kind of the life of the city like the way that i okay. feel malmo is like it, it's a bit of it's kind of it's not like super far outside because the city isn't that big but it's just it feels like there's kind of a, a demarcation line yeah. yeah, but I love the idea of singing together, like making noise together. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's fabulous. I'm part of the community okay. choir there now. It's great fun. Yeah. Cool. And there's all different levels. There are fantastic sopranos from the music society in Mary Matla College. And then there's people oh. who come in with their little books and they just come and sing. So everybody comes together. All right. We need to go visit Hugo. I think we need to go visit. Like, that's Jude. great. Yeah. We're going to come visit you, Jude. Do <laughs> you're more than welcome. <laughs> so I have, I do have another question. If that's okay, I'm, I'm ticking off the list as we go. Yeah. Um. Somebody did ask, did you have a theoretical question at the outset? So oh. did you have a hypothesis? I know it's quite a scientific problem to to ask, and um, but did you <laughs> did you have a theoretical starting? Point. I can talk about it from the perspective of the larger project, which um, was the thing that got funded, which was really just about trying to understand how people understand immigrant integration, like what that looks like and what the role of participatory art is in these changing notions of integration. Um, and that comes from, you know, thinking about this from a migration studies perspective, where in Scandinavia, you know, that what, what, it, what it's meant to integrate has really changed in the last oh, 20 or so years, and especially um, post-2015, um, where, you know, as, whereas before there was a sense that, like, if you moved and you <clears throat> um, learned the language, you got a job, you're set. And now there are all these sorts of cultural expectations and pressures. Um, so Anders Hellström, who is a, a scholar in migration studies at Malmö University, has a really good book on just exactly that, like these sorts of expectations across the Nordics of people who have migrated there. Um, so I was just interested, you know, because there have been all these kinds of grassroots organizations popping up, you know, like what was actually happening and what were the possibilities. And I think with the podcast, like I don't think we had like a, a, a like a hypothesis or a question. I think we were just interested in doing the thing <laughs> and then thinking about how it was perhaps useful to people. I mean, it was really it really felt like a very quick patch job. I think the other the other route was going to be very much more about like urban space and belonging and all kinds of different artistic interventions. 
But this in a way, I think kind of narrowed it down. But Hugo, I mean, maybe you had a theoretical question in I mean, mind that I didn't have. <laughs> I mean, the reason that I was interested in working on the project was I I just uh, kind of got my PhD post, and the the overarching question in in that the the hypothesis, I mean, it wasn't really presented like that, but the hypothesis is that uh, listening is diminished as a critical perspective within medium communication studies. So the focus is on articulations of voice and speech, and what would happen if we took listening as our critical perspective and as an you know to, to try and understand the politics and of community of engagement that exists in listening and when I heard that Erin was working with Const Coupin and I think you already had a, the, the idea of doing like sound mapping or, or like mapping the city and then I was interested in the, the kind of tradition of sound walking and I just you know I was looking for sites of research where I could try and explore this idea of, you know, what does listening bring to critical, in, you know, to, 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 a, a, to, to politics? Thank you. Um, yes, because I think one of the people that were with us last term when we discussed the article, they wondered um, in terms of the politics of listening out, mm. um, I think they'd obviously done some reading themselves and, and they, thought of carp and cauldry and wondered if you'd thought of those two as well is it judith carp and, and nick cauldry yeah I, I don't know carp but nick cauldry i think is 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 interesting i mean the listening out that comes from kate lacy that she makes this distinction between listening in which is the kind of engaged listening and then listening out which is where we make ourselves open to possibilities we may not have considered and um, like she considers to be a more kind of ethical listening engagement. Nick Coldry is really interesting because he's, I mean, there's a really good book, Voice, Why Voice Matters, kind of, it seems like it's, I mean, it, it is risking privileging voice and, and speech, but he, he does also acknowledge listening and the kind of intersubjectivity of the politics of voice. And you know that to to give you know he talks about the politics of voice or the, the the voice as being like giving an account of oneself, telling you know one's own narrative, and mm -hmm. he acknowledges that for that to be a you know political, then it re requires an auditor, it requires someone to receive that narrative. So it, it, you know I think his engagement is more nuanced yeah. than you know it it appears sometimes. The um the carp, sorry, I've just looked it up. Um that's David Carp. Never heard of and it. And it's analytic activism, digital listening, and the new political strategy 2017. Right. right. Well, how does he spell his last name? K-A-R-P-F for Freddie. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll take a look at that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, oh, and I, I, I had, I had a question. It's my own question. <laughs> um, I'm really intrigued that you used the, the title "Picturing Home" when you knew that it was going to be an audio thing. Was that a deliberate evocation of the theatre of the mind kind of thing? <laughs> or, I, don't, I don't even remember how we decided on that name, Hugo. I think that was the the name for the original project. I it think was it was of, no that that's a that's it because we had the more. yeah sorry yeah I think because we had the sort of many Malmo's part of it which was going to be about the walking and the mapping and but then picturing home was also going to be about like the like collage like we had we had ideas about doing a book that was like Lane sorts of like um, like transparent photographs one over another to see how people's like living spaces had changed and um, different things like that or laying family photos over like their new spaces or you know doing these sorts of transparencies and oh yeah we had all these ideas I think it was that that was will, will you never go back to that do you think yes. <laughs> I mean I would I think that we could probably drum up some enthusiasm I think the people who we worked with, a lot of them have scattered. 
Um, so, and the, the, um, the organization closed down because they like didn't apply for more funding. It was just too much. And the people who were running it like really needed to move on. So they've moved away, except for Ansar. Ansar is still around doing his thing with Shako Mako, um, which is an amazing other kind of cultural establishment in, in Malmo. But maybe we should get, maybe we should do that again. I know you're so busy with your, you're so busy with your PhD, Hugo. <laughs> I, I, I think there's like the picturing home. I remember we talked about, you know, should it be, should the title be amended? But but I like you're suggesting, Josephine, and I like this idea of like the radio is about creating vivid images. And I think that that's partly to do, you know, that's also its intimacy, that it's a kind of a collaboration between the, the writer and the voice and how the listener creates their own images and, you know, that reciprocal as well so I think that it's kind of, and then we had a really nice episode or the really nice workshop where people shared images that were important from their home and then talked about it and then converted you know that to the podcast and that's always a really classic radio kind of device asking people to look at photographs and describe them and you know I think that that's also something that works really well so I like I like that idea of the, the vision you know Although my project is about trying to destabilize that, <laughs> exactly. I like the, the visuality of the radio <laughs> as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think the the picturing part too is very much about imagining, right? And like all the different imaginaries that come out of the conversations we were having. Um, so yeah, different meanings of that word. Yeah, because I think, um, is it Dario Linares, um, yeah. Joe has written a piece, Theatre of the Mind, so mm -hmm. with podcasting in mind, so there are quite, there's a little piece of um, research there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have any. Work. Where is that? Yes. The, Pardon? Where is the Dario? Linares. Linares, he is, uh, he had, They had written the first podcasting book. He's... Um, one of the editors that has written a book uh, called sure. Podcasting. But he has a new piece called Theatre of the Mind that he has only written in the past, I think since last year, okay. after the book was published, yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually have, yes. I have a piece coming out in a book that he's editing about podcasts into theory, theory into practice. Podcast. Yes, yes. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. It's great. He and um, Laurie Beckstead are really fantastic editors yeah they're leaders really in researching and Siobhan McHugh as well she's oh my gosh oh I really I know Siobhan. <laughs> Siobhan was so um generous I was actually yes. trying to get her for I'm part of a research network of oral historians which I don't even know how I got tapped into that but it's really fun and they're really interested in stuff really interesting stuff so I was trying to yeah. get her to come and speak to us at one of our workshops but she's in Australia and it was like at an yes. ungodly hour for her she's so great she's so so great so she sent me a video that I was yes. able to show yeah she's yeah. amazing and Richard Berry also yeah yeah, yeah. exactly Richard Berry yeah. is another great contact yeah so there are yeah. quite a few yeah it's great yeah so Joe do we have any more retrospective questions <laughs> um well, I, I've got a comment here. I might have to read it out because I'm not 100% sure what it what it means. Some, so, someone suggested um, how easily we could um, insert community radio into the title instead of podcasting. Mm. So it sounds like home, the synchrony and dissonance of community radio is boundary object. Mm. Um, and then another of our members said she would have liked a critique of the co-creation aspect mm. was there scope for more explanation of mm. of that 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 process of co-creation but it sounds like that's what you're working on next kind of thing with your your next project isn't it with your thinking through the ethics of it all yeah i mean uh, i think that was one of the limitations mm. that you know, because everything we did everything quite quickly, and it was you know we just were reacting to the limitations and possibilities that that we had. That you know, we, we I mean we were hoping that the the participants would become the presenters themselves, and it would you know they would take more of a lead. But it you know it ended up with with us 
initiating and, and doing the final edits and, and stuff, which, you know, which isn't an ideal balance of, of power. But I think in terms of just initiating something and making something happen, we, we you know, we kind of fell into that, that role. I think in an ideal world, if we'd had a bigger cohort and, you know, we, and people that we could have encouraged to do, you know, to host themselves and, and start to, you know, to develop the, the the format themselves that would have been ideal but you know it was it kind of almost like a little a pilot in some ways in, in that way about you know what is actually possible yeah I mean it doesn't certainly the article I think you know where I reread it again this morning and it it doesn't seem like a last minute reactive project it it ties together so well and I I wonder whether that's partly your background in sort of <laughs> radio production because that's kind of how we fly isn't it sort of seat of the pants kind of let's mm. pull this program together we can do it um yeah no I, I i thought it was really good and you are honest about the limitations towards the end as well you know you sum up um aspects where you know you, you feel you, you could have done better so i i think it's a really good article and and you know i think the project is great and i love having the um, the audio there as well as a resource that we can use and dip into alongside the article. That's great. Yeah. And I think also, I mean, the fact that it was so short lived, I mean, like Hugo was saying, it would have been great if people had taken it and given it more life afterwards. But in a way, it's like it's a real honest mirror of some of the grassroots initiatives that have happened around different ways of migration in Scandinavia. Like, and I don't love that about it, um, but I mean, the fact that, for example, a lot of these, like like Kunstkupan would get a ton of funding for like three years. And their yeah. idea too was like, we're gonna start it out yeah. and then we're gonna hand it over to the people who use it and it's gonna be their space and then they can run it. So we're gonna like help people understand the kind of, you know, the bureaucracy and get people to like invest personally in the programming. And then eventually it's going to be run like by people with refugee backgrounds, which is fantastic. I mean, it's a great idea, but I think especially in a case like that, like, like I said, like people are, they have so much happening. I mean, there's just so much going on with their lives. So I think in a way, um, I don't know, maybe it was just what it needed to be, you know, for that moment and without putting any extra kinds of expectations on the people who are participating, but it's still there for them to access, you know, and to, you know, maybe, I don't know, take it further at some other point. But I do love the idea, Jude, of like university radio and that sort of thing has been, I, and I've often thought that like, we need to invest more in terms of our pedagogy with our students in like getting them to do projects like this that have a longer life cycle so that like we can keep engaging with communities of practice in the city too. So yeah, let's aim for that, Hugo. Let's rewrite that the sounds curriculum. Sounds really great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Listen, like um, I'm sure we've exhausted um, all of our questions and you've really been gracious with your time. So um, it just takes for me to say on behalf of Mesca reading group, radio reading group, we'd like to thank you for sharing all of your research with us. It has been, you know, a really fabulous hour and we've all, I'm sure everyone will gain so much from, from it. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thanks for having us. This was really yeah. fun. Thank, thank you. I mean, it, it, I really appreciate like the, um, you know, when you write something and publish it, you're never really sure if anyone is actually going to read it and it's really nice to to know that some people have read it and to get the questions uh joe and, and to, to meet the two of you yeah. so i think like in sweden there's not a, a a big radio studies community i'm not sure it exists at all all podcasting so it's really nice to be able to connect with the two of you and feel some kind of like uh, collegiality around yeah. this, this subject so thank you really appreciate the invitation yeah, not at all. You're very welcome. And thanks again for your time. It's been great.